So, who made New Year's resolutions? Anybody brave enough to raise your hand? Did you make your New Year's resolution? No resolution makers here at all? Okay, we have a few. Um, anyone still, still holding resolution? Uh, has it already failed a bit? Yeah, we've got some mixed results here. Yeah, that's, that's totally normal. I found something by uh, a comment that Mark Twain made regarding resolutions. He says, New Year's Day is, uh, now is the accepted time to make your regular annual good resolutions. Next week, you can begin paving the road to hell with them as usual. I love Mark Twain, has such a, a, a cheeky way of saying a lot with a few words. New Year's resolutions, you know, they don't have the best success rate. And I think that's not all that unusual. And in fact, I've kind of I don't really make resolutions anymore. I, I don't like calling them that anyway because I feel like that's kind of got some baggage and it, it just kind of sets you up for, you know, the first time you, you trip or you drop that or break that resolution. And um, I don't know about you, but I, I, I have a tendency if I've done something, you know, I'm, I'm doing good, but if I mess up once or I don't do it that day, it's like, ah, it's all for nothing, you know. Some, some personality types are more like that than others, and they'll just, oh, well, then just, you know, we won't do that at all anymore. And you drop it, you go the other way. Um, instead of New Year's resolutions, though, I do think there are periodically times where we need a restart or a do-over. And although New Year's Day is, I mean, we put the day system in place. It's nothing special about those 24 hours. I mean, substantively, they're, they're just the same kind of hours as the ones before or after. There's nothing really significant about January 1st. It's just an administrative thing. But it is, I think, sometimes a, a prompt, something that gives us a little, um, you know, a little extra reason, like, okay, let's all start over together. Because that can help helping in keeping New, New Year's resolutions or any other kind of commitment is greatly increased when you have accountability, when you tell somebody else that you're doing it, when you have someone else who's maybe making the same commitment as you and you do it together. Those things tend to increase our success in, in uh, keeping resolutions. I found this book a few years back, and it's called Soul Reset, Breakdown, Breakthrough, and the Journey to Wholeness. It came out in 2019, and it's by Junius B. Dotson, who was the uh, general secretary or CEO of Discipleship Ministries, a United Methodist Church agency, and he was a really he was a fantastic pastor, had planted several churches, and was one of those denominational exec executives that, that I felt really good about. Um, and, you know, we don't always have that. I mean, this guy, he was really great. And sadly, he passed away. Uh, at 55 in 2021, in February, uh, less than a month after announcing that he'd been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. 
it was a it was a really tough loss for a lot of us but this book was really helpful to me in my journey a few years ago when um, I was in a place that where we had to make some really tough decisions and we already knew that and then the pandemic hit and you know everything was brand new every day it was a tough time and this book really helped me keep perspective helped me find a way to kind of start fresh and so I'm going to invite you if you would like in this next six weeks we're going to take a little soul reset together and we'll learn some new spiritual practices along the way we'll practice a different thing each week and we will take an opportunity together with some accountability partners to to try something new to go a little bit healthier way perhaps for Reverend Dotson, everything is rooted in discipleship. Everything comes back to discipleship, to being a discipleship, being a disciple. And he defined discipleship as wholeness, living a life of wholeness in Christ and he said specifically I believe in a God of holistic salvation that God doesn't just want to save us for some place after death but that God wants to save us now here in in physical form God wants to save our souls and our minds as well as our bodies. God isn't divided into these little subcategories or limited to, you know, just our spiritual life like we tend to compartmentalize. God wants to save all of us every part and and Dotson defined that with wholeness and he believed that a, a good way to understand that invitation to wholeness is in Matthew chapter 11 Jesus said come to me all you who are struggling hard and carrying heavy burdens, heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Put on my yoke and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble, and you will find rest for yourselves. My yoke is easy to bear, and my burden is light. Let us hear what the Spirit is speaking to God's people. I actually really like um, the way he puts that, the way the message uh, version of the Bible puts it, and uh, Dotson held this up as well. One thing that's interesting is Jesus was talking to his disciples. Jesus was talking to religious people here in this particular invitation. He's talking to us. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real 
rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. How does that sound? Living freely and lightly? That sounds pretty good to me. Because when I'm honest with myself, that's not my default. You know, living in, in freedom and joy and, and not weighed down by the cares of the world, I wish that was my normal. But it's really not. My default is I care about everything and I think about everything and I worry about what's going on and what I'm supposed to be doing about it. And if I'm being totally transparent, I've struggled a lot with the default thinking that I have to be good. I have to earn good in order for God to love me. In order for me to be good, I, I have to do. I have to be worth, you know, my worth is dependent on what I do and how well I do it. That's a struggle for not all of us, but some of us. And what Dotson says is that when we grow in our discipleship, we come to understand, to know that God's love for us is not dependent on our productivity or our positivity. God's love for us is unconditional. When I read that on our productivity or positivity, I began immediately to feel lighter. Because sometimes, although I intellectually know that I can't earn God's grace, it doesn't mean that I always, like, all of me understands that all of the time. And I've worked a lot on that productivity part and not placing my worth in whether I get the whole to-do list accomplished and, and how well I execute these tasks. But I had been struggling with, well, if you really were, you know, growing in your discipleship, if you were where you should be, then you should always be positive, at least. You should not assume the worst or be pessimistic. And so I had felt guilty for not being, you know, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. Um, and like I said, that's, that's just not my default. I'm too realistic for that. I know too much for that. And so we are not, though, judged by our positivity any more than our productivity. This invitation that Christ gives here, it calls to me. It speaks to me on a deep level. I want rest. Because I think we all know that you can like 
stop doing stuff for a while, but that's not always rest. There's a difference between just collapsing from this built-up frenetic activity and pausing intentionally for a renewing rest. Those are different. I used to be really bad about only taking those intentional pauses. Well, they weren't so intentional. They were like when my body said, nope, if you aren't listening to me, I'm going to shut off now. And over the last five, ten years, I've gotten a little bit better in that. I've managed to um, catch that before I get to complete exhaustion and burnout. So I'm, I'm making progress, but by no means am I perfect. And this book is one of the ways that I have made progress in that. So I would really encourage you, if you'd like, you can even uh, purchase the book, or if you'd like me to order some copies for you, I'd be glad to. Um, you can get them from Amazon.com or UpperRoomBooks.com, UpperRoom.org. So um, I'm looking forward to this. One of the things that struck me by Dotson's book so much is how honest and, and forthcoming he is. And to be honest, that can be really challenging for pastors because we're not supposed to reveal too much. You know, we're supposed to like have everything together and not look like we're struggling. And, you know, we don't want to be a bad example. And I mean, I know as well as anybody that I'm a real person and that's not always what's happening. But to read that in a publication, I was surprised. I was surprised. And I'll tell you more in the coming weeks how, how I identified with and this book and, and how God used it to work. But Dotson addresses it specifically. He says, like, I know this might surprise you. <laughs> to put this in print. And he admits, yeah, it is a little bit intimidating. But he says, vulnerability and authenticity are the only way to find wholeness in Jesus Christ. We have to be our true selves we have to be open about our true selves. We have to be vulnerable in order to experience God's healing and wholeness. And the church, frankly, we could do a better job of making it a safe place, of building community where we can be, where we are encouraged to be more vulnerable. I think that happens well in some uh, small groups. I know some of your Sunday school classes, you may, be, you may experience that regularly, and that's wonderful. I think that's something we all can, can work on. Instead of thinking we have to put on our best face every Sunday morning and act like we've got everything together, it's okay not to be okay. And it's okay to say, I'm not really okay. You don't have to fix it, but I'm just, I'm just letting you know. Just being real. I think that's part of it. John Wesley had a very intentional method of discipleship that included this authenticity and vulnerability. Part of his system was that people who were seeking to grow in their faith would be members of a class meeting, is what he would call it, but it'd be a small group 
of like no more than 12, 15 people tops. And they would come together weekly. And they would be honest about their struggles, where they'd been. They would look and reflect honestly inward about how they'd done that week, what was happening in their lives. And oftentimes they would begin with this question, how is it with your soul? That's a way different question than, hey, how are you doing? How are things going? That's not what we care about. How is it with your soul? Good Wesleyans will check in with each other on that. I got a text last week or the week before with, uh, from my mentor asking, how is it with your soul? It's a good reminder to slow down and to think about that and to be honest about not just what's happening, but how is it affecting you? How are you reacting, processing, moving? How is it with your soul? So that's a great question. Um, this invitation, uh, as I said, we'll be practicing some different things. And there was an insert in your bulletin. You hopefully received one of these. Um, little two-sided thingy. Um, and it's called Soul Reset Week 1. It's labeled. This starts today. This week we are going to learn and practice a spiritual discipline called the examine. And it's spelled E-X-A-M-E-N, which is um, different than like a test or an examination. It's similar, but this is a particular practice that is um, associated with, originated by Ignatius of Loyola in the 15th century. And basically what you do is you take a moment at the close of each day. So just before you get in bed or as you're, you know, fit this into your nightly routine somehow, a few moments, you take a moment to, to kind of quiet and center yourself. And then you reflect on, look back over the day's events. Start in the morning, go back through not just what happened, but how did I feel about that? How did I respond to that? Did I respond a way that I'm still proud of? Am I, you know, could I have done that better? And specifically in this Ignatian examine, you're looking for moments in which you felt close to God, which Ignatius called consolation and times you may have felt distant from God or disconnected from God and he called that desolation and it's important to know he wasn't saying good moments and bad moments both of these states can be used by God for our spiritual growth they're just different ways of, of experiencing and relating to God. Moments of, so, consolation and desolation. They can both speak to us. So, the whole practice, like the original Ignatian exam and practice, is very, very detailed, takes quite a bit longer, and goes over an extended period of time. We're going to just try it out in small chunks. And so you'll find each day uh, there will be a prompt, a um, question or questions for reflection. So start the day each time by finding a quiet space, centering yourself, putting the phone down, Maybe you find it helpful to do something that will 
kind of keep your attention like lighting a candle. Um, feel free to do something like that or, or go into a, a, a special place that you've designated as a sacred space. Uh, hold a prayer blanket or item. Any of those things might be helpful. And then reflect on whichever prompt is for that day. So we'll start this evening with day one. And when we get ourselves centered, we will ask, what brought you the most joy today? And go from there. If you're like, I'm going to lose this the moment we walk out the door, we've got you. Specifically, Cliff has got you covered. Because I was like going to get around to this, but Cliff did it. Um, so we have a link to download this document um, and a, a QR code that you can actually also just use to, to take a picture with your phone and it'll send you right to that document. And so don't worry if you lose this, we've got you covered and um, you can find that on our Facebook, uh, on our, the, the same Facebook page where we do our, our live stream. We can, you can find that there. I hope that you will um, try this out with me this week. I hope you will find it um, meaningful. And I hope it is something uh, maybe new, but also that you find that doing it together, we have some momentum. We have some accountability uh, to, to try, try new things and grow together. Dotson ends the, the first chapter then with an invitation to the covenant prayer in the Wesleyan tradition. We can actually find a version of this in our hymnal, um, but I've printed here for you a slightly contemporary version that's just changed up the, little, the words a little bit so we don't have as many like vines and vows, a uh, little bit more modern language, but essentially the same prayer. John Wesley says that this covenant prayer was first used in 1755. 1755. He had a worship service that was a covenant renewal service. And there were 1,800 people who prayed this prayer together. How cool is that? And 250 years later, we are going to pray a prayer together, also asking God and to renew our covenant and to recommit. Wesley's covenant re renewal service, in case you're ever curious, we do have that in the book of worship, and I think there's some in, uh, some of it is in your hymnal. And it's often done on, like, New Year's Day or the first Sunday of the new year. But since there weren't, like, I figured a whole bunch of people going to be here on New Year's morning. Um, I thought we would do this prayer today. So if you would like, please join me in this covenant prayer. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you, praised for you or criticized for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now... O wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine, and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it also be made in heaven. Amen. It's important to note that that prayer is what I like to call aspirational. 
<laughs> means we may not be there yet, but this is where we want to be. So even if you were a little taken aback by some of the words, I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I'm there yet. I'm not sure I want to be there yet. It's a prayer that you pray until you mean it. If you are looking to make a, a change, a commitment, or grow in your commitment to Christ, and you think this is the right time, time when a lot of people are starting something new and we're starting something new, we would love to help you with that. If that's to give your life to Christ for the first time, or perhaps reaffirm your faith in Christ, or if that's to join this community of faith, uh, or find out what is next in your journey, then I would love to help you with that. We would be honored to be a, uh, partners with you on this journey. And so if you would like to uh, make any of those decisions this morning, you can do so. Come and tell me as we're singing our, our closing song, or you are welcome to contact me during the week and we can visit about that anytime. Um, so let us stand as you are able and sing together. What a friend we have in Jesus. again for joining us in worship for making it a priority to be with us in worship and join us online you have made an effort to start your week with God and we appreciate that you would do that with us and my prayer for you this week is that as you go looking for times that you have been close to God or felt distant from God, that you would see all moments as an opportunity to grow closer to the person that God has created you to be. Go in peace.